excellent word What more can he say Than to you he has said To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled Fear not, I am with thee O oh, be not dismayed Shall be thy supply The flame shall not hurt thee I only design Thy dross to consume And thy gold to refine The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose I will not, I will I'm glad that we have this opportunity to be together here to worship our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ while we're, we're here at Harlandale Christian Church. Welcome to our fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our house of worship as we lift up the holy name of our God, our Father in heaven, and our Lord and Savior Jesus. It's good for us to be together. It's good for us to to join our hearts, our lives, our voices together as we celebrate God's blessing, His provision, His grace and mercy, how firm a foundation our God is. The psalmist David says in Psalm 25, verses 8 and 10, uh, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore He instructs sinners in His ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them in his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. And so today, we commit ourselves during this worship time and to begin here in every day and every moment of our lives to keep God's covenant so that he might bless us so that he might save us. Let's worship him in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence here among us through your spirit. Thank you for uh, our fellowship of brothers and sisters here at Harlandale Christian Church that uh, we have this privilege of coming to lift up your holy and precious name to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity for those who worship with us online and distance uh, that we can join our voices in praise and song and join our hearts in fellowship and in worship of you. Father, you are great. We humble ourselves to you and we ask you to, to speak to our hearts through your spirit today. Teach us your way 
as we worship you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
What a beautiful Savior we have. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. The same Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, who had dinner, had supper, had celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples right before he was crucified. He took the bread of that meal and broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body that is broken for you. And the next day he would be pierced, cut, stabbed, nailed to the cross. He took the cup after the, the, the meal and he said, take, drink this cup. This represents my body, uh, my blood that is shed for you for the remission of sins. And on that cross, he shed his blood for you, me, for them, for all who believe in him as Savior, as Messiah, as the Christ. In Jesus Christ alone is our salvation. In Jesus Christ alone is our peace and our reconciliation. In Jesus Christ alone is our redemption and our hope of eternal life with him, with God in heaven. Our hymn of communion today is just that song, In Christ Alone. As we partake of these emblems and if you're worshiping with us, in your home. I hope that you have set aside the bread and the juice to be able to partake of the Lord's Supper with us at this time. But let's meditate upon the words of this song, in Christ alone I place my trust, in Christ alone we have salvation, redemption, and the grace from God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread and this cup that reminds us of the price that was paid for our salvation, for our redemption, for our forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for this remembrance that you have provided to us as Christians through, through all of the ages that even as Paul wrote to the church in Corinth to take and participate and partake of these emblems and remember that Jesus is coming again to receive us, to take us home. Thank you, Father, that in Christ alone is your grace, your mercy, and our salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm.
down through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh, the fullness of God in helpless play, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died. Well, let's think about bread for a moment. Bread. <laughs> Something used to hold the main part of a sandwich together, right? Or a side item to go along with the main meal. It's something American children 
tear the crust off of before they eat that bread. You know, bread in our modern Western culture, it's just not a necessity anymore, is it? Some people function quite easily without bread. Many of our low-carb diet plans encourage us to avoid it altogether and do away with it. There's a lot of other more healthy stuff to eat, these diet plans would tell us. But at the end of the day, bread is an ordinary option against a, a, a backdrop of endless dietary choices. We can take it or leave it. But friends, it wasn't that way in Bible times. At the very center of life during the times of Jesus, and even way before that, stood the stalks of grain that sustained life from day to day. Without bread, there was no life. I, I, share with, I want to share with you this excerpt, this quote from Abraham Ribony, the author of The Syrian Christ, so that we can get a sense of the importance, the impact of bread to the ancient people, as well as some modern cement, uh, semit, uh, Semitic minds. Ribbony says, as the son of a Syrian family, I was brought up to think of bread as possessing a mystic sacred significance. I would never step on a piece of bread that had fallen on the road, but I would pick it up, press it to my lips for reverence, and place it in a wall or on some other place where it would not be trodden upon. What always seemed to me to be one of the noblest traditions of my people was their reverence to the Aish, or bread, literally the life giver. While breaking bread together, we would not rise to salute an arriving guest, whatever their social rank. Whether spoken or not, our excuse for not rising and engaging in the, the cordial salutation before the meal was ended was our reverence for the food, the bread. We could, however, and we always did, invite the newcomer who most urgently came, invite them to partake of this meal. The Aish was something more than mere matter. And as much as it sustained life, it was God's own life made tangible for his child, man, to feed upon. The Most High himself fed our hunger. Does not the psalmist say, Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth the, the desire of every living thing? Hmm. These words published in 1916. But it gives us insight to that Semitic mind. Bread also speaks of a covenant. The expression that some people have used in the past, there's bread and salt between us, gives us the idea that the, the parties were one in a solemn agreement. A vow that invoked these terms spoke of the highest kind of commitment to each other or to the principles of that commitment. In fact, this is what happened when Abraham was greeted by the priest Melchizedek in the book of Genesis. We also see it in, the, uh, in the, the Psalms, in Psalm 41, when David says, Even my close friend, someone whom I trusted, one who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. The, they didn't just have a good meal together. They made a sacred covenant, commitment, contract, if you will, if you will. And the breaking of bread was to be a seal and a reminder of their commitment to one another. Now friends, this is what Jesus was talking about at the Lord's Supper. Jesus was making a sacred oath, a vow, a covenant, a legal contract. He was expressing a sacred oath with his disciples in that upper room. He didn't bring in a lawyer, a court reporter, or a notary when he did this. According to ancient tr tradition, he broke bread with them. 
And what is our part of that covenant? Eat, remember, and receive the full provision of Christ who dwells in you richly. Now let's fast forward to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. John, in his record of Jesus' ministry, in chapter 6, he, he tells us that Jesus has just fed the 5,000 with that miraculous distribution and multiplication of the five loaves and two fish. Now Jesus has gone to the other side of the lake to get away from the crowds, but they followed him to the other side. And so from his conversation with them, we learn three things about human nature. The first, we're always hungry for the wrong things. In John 6, verse 26 and 27, we have this. You're looking for me because you want to have your bellies filled again. Don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which I will give to you. Now, this might be a reference that Jesus is making back to Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 3, where Isaiah says, why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your labor for what does not satisfy? But it also brings to mind Jesus' words in what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33, where Jesus says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Friends, ask yourself this question today. No, ask yourself this question every day. What do I really want? What am I really hungry for? Not just the, the superficial or physical needs of food and clothing and shelter, but the deeper spiritual needs that, that separate, that distinguish us as human beings from all other creation or creatures. And let's learn to measure wealth, not by the things that you have, but by the things you have for which you would not take any money. The second thing that we learn about human nature, we expect God to provide us with those wrong things. Think about it. These people were running after Jesus just hoping that he would perform another miracle of, of multiplying the food, giving them something that they didn't bring, something that they didn't have for themselves, basically just so that they could have their bellies filled again. And Jesus called them on it. He knew that they were not seeking God. They weren't seeking God's word, but rather they were seeking things that they hoped would go that God would do for them. Friends, how about you? Check your prayer life. Check your prayer list. What do you ask God for most often? Do you want God more than anything else like a deer panting for streams of water, his presence, his flowing, his life flowing within you? Do you want God? Or do you ask God to do things for you? Or do you just want the same stuff everybody else wants and you just hope and you pray that God will give it to you? A third aspect of our nature. We're always demanding that God prove himself to us. Look in John 6 verse 30. What miraculous sign will you give that we may see it and believe? Remember the day before they were, uh, th they were part of this crowd of 5,000 people that had been fed from five loaves and two fish. 
And then they offered us this suggestion, still thinking about their stomachs, apparently. So they say to, uh, to Jesus in verse 31, Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Which then brings us to the focus of our message today. Jesus identified himself as the bread of life. First, he did this indirectly in, and in the third person in verse 33. He says, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. How did they respond to this statement that Jesus made? They said, oh, sir, from now on, give us this bread. They still don't know what he's talking about. They're still thinking physically, materially, like the woman at the well that we talked about last Lord's Day in our message, the, the, the woman who wanted the water so that she would never have to come to the well again. <clears throat> and they're comparing this to Moses and the manna in the wilderness. So in verse 35, Jesus gets more direct, more to the point with them. He says, I am. Remember? I am. The same name that God told Moses. That's who sent him. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And then Jesus gives this challenge in verse 36. But you've seen me, and yet you still do not believe. Friends, everyone here this morning has seen Jesus. That is, we understand his claims to some degree. We understand, we believe Jesus is the Son of God. We accept him and we believe him to be the Savior of the world. And yet we don't believe it. We don't believe as he was speaking to the people in this crowd. We don't believe it. How do I know that? Because we're still spending our money on what doesn't satisfy us. We're still demanding that God prove himself to us in our physical, in our material, in the day, and in our present physical being. So then we see the aftermath of this whole episode, this whole conversation in chapter, John chapter 6, verses 52 to 59. I have to admit, what follows here is one of the most difficult sections in Scripture. There's just no sugarcoating it. But in verses 53 to 56, Jesus said to them, Verily, very truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. And then we see the result. In verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? In the Greek, it literally reads something like this. What? What are you talking about? But in private with his disciples, in verse 63, Jesus explains himself. When he says, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are spirit and life. In other words, he explains to the disciples, I'm talking about spiritual realities, not physical flesh and blood. And that same message when he said to the crowd, whoever eats this he eats my flesh, whoever drinks my blood. He was talking about spiritual, accepting his grace 
his sacrifice that was yet to come. And that's the same message to us today. But do you see what's next in verse 66 of John 6? This was still too much for some of them. Because John records in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now remember, he's not talking about the 12 that Jesus selected and chose as his disciples, who later became known as apostles. He's talking about the ones who were disciples, learners, who were a bit more dedicated than just the crowds who were following along. But with this saying, John says from this time many of his disciples, many of his learners, many of his followers turned back and no longer followed him because it was too hard in their physical, in their thinking and material and physical ways. So then Jesus does the proverbial line in the sand with his twelve. He looks at the twelve that he has chosen, that he has handpicked, and he says, you do not want to leave too, do you? And in verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That reveals the power of what Jesus says when he says, I am the bread of life. So friends, here's our dilemma today. Here is the crux of the matter. Jesus is not who we want him to be. He is not just some being or some uh, existence that we can shape him into who and how we want him to look and act and be. He's not a genie in a bottle. Jesus will not always meet your expectations of what, of what you want God to do for you. But remember what he said. He is the bread of life. He is the sustenance the source, the nourishment of our whole existence, of our whole spirit, of our relationship with God. And, and friends, there's absolutely no place to go for real life any better than Jesus Christ. You know that's true. And God will show you that the pain, the failure, the disappointment, the stumbling that we all face in this life, they're all a necessary part of the mystery of this life that we have in God and in Christ. Because the walk of faith begins with a stumble. As we realize that only Jesus can provide us with the bread that feeds our deepest hunger the needs of our heart, the needs of our soul, our spirit, life eternal that God our Father provides for us through the bread of life, Jesus. Our song of decision and dedication today is one that says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He replaces uh, the thoughts of all of our physical and material things with his spirit, his strength, his nourishment, his grace, his forgiveness. Jesus the bread of life, our life, our hope, our salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for 
showing us in your word who Jesus is. We have read uh, and we know through the scriptures that Jesus is your son. We accept him as our savior, as your way to give us grace and mercy. Father, we're hungry today. And we're hungry for your spiritual food. We come here aware of our physical needs and our human desires. But today, Father, as we know and as we sing this song and we recognize that Jesus paid the price for us, make us aware of our deeper, more important hunger in our souls in our spirits. And Father, feed us today with the bread of life, your Son, the I Am. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah uh -huh.